Um, I want to thank Collective Shout and Corn Harms for inviting me along today to talk about some of the work that I do with men. And as was described in my introduction, I'm, I'm a psychotherapist. And Excuse me, just move your speaker up a bit. When you face that way, yeah. it's loud, and when you face us, yeah. just twist it. Or you twist it. Right. <laughs> My assistant. Is that right? <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk about some of the work that I do and my own lived experience as well. Um, and I just want to check in with everyone here. How are we sort of feeling? Because talking about pornography can be distressing. And we're going to hear some things today that are going to be distressing. So I just want you all to invite you all to sort of be attuned to stuff that might be you know, running through you. And just sort of be open to that and perhaps talking to someone about it if you're feeling upset about something you've heard. So um, I'm going to look at the work that I do. I'm going to, we're going to look at patterns today, patterns around use, um, how pornography is used to soothe emotional distress and how pornography is used to reinforce negative self-belief, much like a problem gambler, gambler or a gambling addict might be drawn continually back to gamble to prove their status as a loser. And we're going to look at the role of shame in, uh, in, as, as a barrier to seeking help. But with the case studies, certainly my own experience and um, the case studies and the men I work with, what is common with all of them is the age of early exposure. Because if there's one actor playing a key role in relation to the magnitude of harm caused in later on in their relationships, it's the age of first exposure. And I think what's becoming evident in my, my work, my research, which is not empirical, by the way, it's much more anecdotal um, through my own observations of working with men, um, is that the greater chance, um, uh, the, greater the, the earlier the exposure, the greater the chance of problems later on in life. Now, of course, there's variables around the nature of the pornography that young people are exposed to. And whether or not there's someone there to support them, to help them rationalise and understand and accept what they've seen. And while I work with men who have problems with pornography, I also interview a lot of men who, where pornography doesn't seem to be a problem. They either use it compatibly within their relationships or it bears no interest for them. And the distinguishing factor there is the fact that those, that group of men were usually exposed to pornography later on so in their late teens or perhaps their early 20s. And they've had a much likelier, there's a greater likelihood that they've actually had a, a real relationship, be it affectionate or, or intimate, or perhaps they've got the, the emotional or sexual maturity to be able to um, balance out what it is they've seen. And it's those first experiences, those real experiences, that become their navigational centre point for all their relationships and their sexual identity later on in life. Or perhaps they've had the emotional maturity to see porn for what it is, which is fake. So, I talk about problematic pornography use rather than porn addiction, and that's because the term porn addiction doesn't really resonate very well with the men that I work with. I certainly see what's going on for them as problematic, but addic addiction lays in a whole other level of complexity uh, that tends to derail any sort of process around seeking a solution. But certainly they see me because they are having problems in their relationship which they attribute back to their use of pornography. And when I'm talking about pornography, I'm talking about sexually explicit content, filmed prostitution. And the, the problems start to occur because a long t well, not that long ago, pornography was restricted content. So it was, it was film, video or magazine and it required effort and it required money and it required determination to procure it. And if you, and if you, and so it was restricted content and still if you're, wanting to if, if you're wanting to procure publications or videos or films, it still is a, a regulated product. And I'm happy to be corrected here, but if you look into Australian legislation on the Australian Parliamentary website into pornography, there's no mention whatsoever on, uh, on internet pornography. It still relates to 
publications, videos or films, which is something that possibly needs to be changed. But with the internet came a pornography onslaught that we know all about. And it became so accessible, so affordable, so available and anonymous that it could be, uh, it could be viewed or consumed by anyone, anywhere, of any age, at any time. So, you know, for me as a boy growing up, I remember that there was, that there was uh, no commodity more highly regarded than pornography. And this is the 70s, mind you, in suburban Melbourne, so it was footy cricket and the, and the suburban swimming pool was our entertainment. And pornography, when it came into our environment, was a radical element of excitement. It was risky for the fear of being caught and obviously the nature of the content, but it was a window into an adult world that my friends and I craved so much. And we craved it because all the grown-ups seemed to have fun. They made the choices, they had the power, they could do cool things like drive cars. But, and it was, the power of it was sexual curiosity sealed by the excitement of arousal and ultimately ejaculation as we matured. But pornography was hard to come by and after a few weeks of looking at the same imagery over and over and over again, uh, it was ultimately boring. The novelty was lost. And as we've talked about today, and what you obviously understand, this is exciting, the room's filling up, it's popular, um, is what we understand here. Now, I did have all this beautifully tabulated, whoops, across to the other side, but unfortunately in the transmission of my PowerPoint, so my tabulations have gone out, so you'll just have to excuse that. Um, fast forward to a digital world, we have an unending novelty, unending supply of high speed, high definition, high quality imagery. And in fact, some people argue that it is pornography that actually drove the desire to have high speed internet in homes. And people talk about how pornography was fundamental to so many of the innovations that we have online these days, such as paywalling and video streaming. Um, all of that originated from the pornography industry. And of course on the internet there are no watersheds on content or, ac ac or accessibility. Combine pornography with the internet and we have a powerful cocktail and many problems coming from that. And there's growing evidence to show how this is occurring because the internet just doesn't facilitate access to pornography. It, ex it accentuates it and it transforms what people look at and how they look at it. It creates an illusion of control over lives and desires and it fuels sexual omnipotence. And all of this seems very intoxicating to a young mind and certainly to, to older minds as well actually and the ways in which boys and men relate to girls and women and sexuality and possibly violence. we go. So I mentioned to you, for those who have just joined in here, I'm going to talk about some case studies. And I'm going to start on those quite soon. But first I want to sort of share with you the case study that, um, that is best researched. And that's me. So, you know, all of my work, all of my work I do with men. I started with myself. I practiced on myself with my training as a psychotherapist. So, for me, three years ago, the life as I was living it came to an abrupt halt. Uh, my wife discovered evidence of my pornography use across numerous devices. I'd always thought that I'd successfully hidden that and kept it secret, and had done so for 12 years at that stage. And um, that 12 years of marriage was, was very unhappy. It was unsatisfying. It was emotionally atrophied is the best way I'd describe it. All stemming from my emotional hiding. Finding solace in pornography and not my wife. And that was all exacerbated by my wife's grief and anger around her disappearing husband. So three years ago my hidden self revealed itself. And I'd been caught before and managed to squirm and lie and blame and, and get out of it. And all 
facilitated by the fact that my wife really not wanting to believe that she had a husband who viewed pornography. Because you know, my wife's a feminist, and she'd married a pro-feminist husband. And how could it be <coughs> that this would have occurred? So obviously uh, a number of issues come up for my wife around social anxiety, around trust. And, but it was true. And, but when this time that I got caught, something happened. I stopped running, I stopped lying, I stopped blaming. And I basically I'd run out of road. I couldn't run any further. And the result, of course, was extremely explosive. But I'd made a decision to confront this no matter what. Because inside I was dead. And there was nowhere for me to go at that stage. So I chose that this was, for me, was a chance to wake up. The author Robert Bly, in his book Iron John, writes about a process. Uh, he writes about masculine rites of passage. That's R-I-T-E-S. Rites of passage. And one of the pathways he writes about is called catabasis, which is a movement downward or a travel downward. And that was certainly the journey for me, is the travel downward to the point of my emotional distress, which, if I was to locate that within my, within my, my person, it's in my body emotional distress. So, and this is the place where my pornography kept me from entering. And because pornography me, for me was a way of soothing pain. Pornography for me and the men I work with is often a symptom of something else, some sort of emotional distress, emotional pain. And I think this is why we call it porn, um, pornography addiction, because as we know, addiction is a way of coping with pain. Um, and then pornography is a way of numbing ourselves and uh, obviously what we know about addiction is often they are the chemicals that do numb ourselves. So I was numbing myself, numbing, I was numb to the world and myself. Um, pornography for me was not about desire, not about sexual pleasure, um, not about curiosity, not about yearning, it was about escape. It was an effective vehicle for me to run away and done in isolation. And if I think back to myself in that space, there is that real sense of just being the only person there doing that. No sense of the world around me. Hence, we will hear about consequences today. And you sit back and you go, how could that happen? But there is that sense of absolute isolation that nothing else exists. So for other men, for other men, they also talk about stress, they talk about anxiety, they talk about self-loathing, boredom, and also there's issues around self, self-rewarding as well. So it's a running from something or a movement towards, but it's very rare that it'll be a, a sexual thing, in my experience of the men that I work with. So the solution. The solution is I work with there's two significant shifts that need to take place to break the hold for the individual on pornography. The first one is reality. So I run therapeutic group workshops for men and the reality and the intensity of the intimacy in those group therapeutic workshops is the antidote that those men are looking for. For the guys that walk into my workshops, they have the opportunity to experience intimacy for the first time. They walk in with a very blurred sense of what is intimacy is and what is sexuality. Because what is intimacy and what is sex? It's incredibly blurred and obviously when we see porn, there's no intimacy, it is just sex. There's a, a great Israeli speaker who talks about porn, his name's Rand Gavulari. And I don't know if you've seen his talks, but he talks about sex, uh, porn is sex with no hands because you don't see the touching. Uh, the second is um, having the group creates, breaks down that sense of isolation, the intimacy within that group breaks down the sense of isolation and allows them to reveal something to themselves and then by doing that creating the possibility for change. The second is compassion, a compassionate presence. So to, for, to receive the compassion from another individual, it creates the opportunity for men to see some compassion for themselves and to realise that actually they deserve better and they deserve something better for the people in their lives as well. 
I mentioned very early on that we're going to talk about shame as being one of the significant barriers to, um, to seeking some sort of solution. And it is because it's, it's shameful to have shame. And confronting that comes at great cost, but with great reward as well. Shame's like this master emotion that just sits on top of everything else. And unless we can prize the lid off that and get underneath what's going on, we don't have a chance for those men. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about sh sh um, sexual shame. And as I talk about it, you know, I sort of invite you to sort of to step into what it might be like for guys in that space looking to confront what is a big obstacle for them. So as we were growing up, it's possible that some of us were made to feel that there's something shameful about sex. As we were drawn to exploring our bodies and later on other people's bodies, that there was something shameful about us as well. And it's possible that somewhere that, root took, took, that, that belief took root and persists deep within people and affects every area of our lives. And it's possible that we ended up feeling that somehow there was something badly wrong with us. And this is sexual shame. Shame of who we believe ourselves to be, shame of our sexuality, shame that we're not the adults we'd hoped we would become or should be. And for men suffering under the weight of shame, pornography provides a disconnection from their bodies and who they are. It's uniquely geared to whisper them sweet promises. I mean, you don't even have to go looking for porn now. It comes looking for you. But it demands of them a cost, which is a loss of connection to who they are and their true sexuality, which is a, a key part of our identity, and in the case of men, their masculinity. And not only that, because as I mentioned before, the barrier to seeking shame is even more shame. It's shameful to have shame. So the solution, of course, is found with getting to the source of the shame. What is driving what's driving the behaviour. The uh, Fritz Perls, who's the, um, who was one of the founding, one of the founders of Gestalt Psychotherapy, always said that nothing changes until it becomes exactly what it is. So I'm going to look at some case studies here, and I apologise that it's, it's not empirical, it is just based on my observational um, work with these men. But I've chosen four men. I'm going to time. I've chosen four men, and they're all aged between 30 and 48, and there's a number of patterns in common. They all speak of some sort of emotional or physical abandonment taking place early on in life. And in the case of Matthew, he was abandoned by his father, who left to start a new family in the US, only to have that family fail and him return to Australia much later on, um, which re-traumatised him. Um, Aaron grew up with his mother and was exposed to a range of inappropriate male role models, um, boyfriends who introduced him to pornography deliberately. Um, Craig's parents, he, they ran a highly su successful business and he grew up in luxury, not wanting anything. But his parents had high expectations of him and they were mostly not around. So perhaps his wanting with his parents was just unavailable for him. And Richard's parents divorced early and his father moved into state. Common factor is all men as they are exposed to pornography before the age of 10. All in one case, uh, it was the discovery of a father's collection. So something under the bed, in the cupboard, in the garage. Um, the other had it introduced to him by an older boy who in turn became his abuser. Um, it is this early relationship with pornography that all men identify that create a founding uh, uh, that create, there are the founding of the problems for later on in life in their relationships. They all participated in two group therapy sessions um, of a day each and six individual sessions and all, one, all but one recognised that the use of pornography was causing problems later on. Sorry, I should have been clicking through this as I was going. So some common observational behaviours. Um, inability to form strong um, friendships. So emotional un unavailability, hiding. Um, inability to relate to girls and women. Again, emotional unavailability, un unavailability. Low self-esteem, sexual perversions, and not presenting as very male. 
and are blurring the lines between sex and intimacy. And this quote from Richard, who's going to feature a little bit here. Richard writes, I would go out of my way to actually avoid intimacy or sexual encounters for fear of failing or not living up to the standard I witnessed set by the men in the movies I watched. With Craig, pornography alternated, well, it, it, it swapped with sexting, so it would be porn or it would be sexting. And he was unaware of any negative impact on his ability to write with women because he was popular with women. He was wealthy, he was good-looking, he was intelligent, and he was, he was happy to flirt through sexting. But um, he did acknowledge that all his female friends at one time or one stage being sexual partners, even just for um, one night or one experience. However, his well ingrained habits were incong incongruent with married life, um, which is when he sought help saw shortly after getting married. Um, he's the youngest of the group and a digital native, and his sessions revealed a deep sense of self-loathing which was connected to his parents' high expectations and his abuse. Um, and through his sessions, he was actually, actually able to talk to his parents for the first time about, about the abuse, which was significant and helpful for him. Um, he felt him that his poor news kept him emotionally insulated from the traumatic experience of being abused and helped him to resolve some of those issues as well. Um, Richard is the oldest of the group. Um, he's 48. And I'm going to choose to look at some of the comments that he makes. And I'm not sure whether it's because of the extended period of time. So we're looking at pretty much 30 years of consistent pornography use. Um, or his motivation for change because he's recently got engaged. So we'll focus on him as a single case study. So when he was asked about his first experience of pornography and how his consumption developed, he observed, it's up here for your reading as well, um, but I've got a little bit more here that I'll read. Um, Most of my life was spent in search for and procurement of porn. It was a preoccupation that would occasionally put me in hazardous situations. The internet, of course, has taken all that out of the question. It's the nature of the addiction, although the blueprint of my preferences was laid out early with the discovery of centrefolds, and so my enjoyment has always relied on the notion of complicity. So he grew up with the, with the penthouse and the playboy, where, um, which was fundamentally different to what we see today. I preferred people I was looking at to be relaxed and comfortable, not subjugated to or abused in pain. I visited Amsterdam when I was 21 and saw real and perverse hardcore porn and found it disturbing and ludicrous. So rather than more explicitness, I just wanted more full on. Um, like any addiction, too much was rarely enough and there have been occasions throughout my life when I had veritable stories of printed material, boxes of VHS tapes, all of which informed and corrupted my notions of sex and sexuality. When asked about the impact of porn on his sexuality, he writes this. I think this is where porn becomes the most corrosive in the misguiding, the misguiding way it portrays sex. It's the impact it has on one's mind, particularly because it carries shame and stigma with it also. Although probably less now uh, with the word porn having so much part of our vernacular. However, I spent years hating myself and feeling guilty because of pornography and the notion that I would never be good enough to pleasure a woman crippled any chances of having and maintaining a healthy and loving relationship. I spent the better part of my life hiding this guilty secret and carrying the burden of embarrassment, self-loathing and shame. It stymied my understanding of women, although I've always had close female friends. I hid behind the notion of being a nice guy, a caring friend, an empath who treated women with respect and, and equality. I lived a lie a lot of the time. I couldn't meet or relate a woman without wondering what she looked like naked, bent over, or whatever. It stopped me connecting with other people and essentially robbed me of my masculinity. So I'm going to finish with a thought. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Fritz Bells wrote, nothing changes until it becomes what it is. I think pornography, because of its nature, is a symptom of something. Else. Porn, in its most basic form, is suffering from the people regularly duped into producing it to those caught in its voyeuristic web. 
It consumes people on both sides of the screen or the lens. Um, solutions emerge by accepting that you're going through pain in the first place. Emotional distress. This is why we spend endless amounts of time with distractions and stimuli to make us forego temporarily whatever distress it is that we've experienced or what we're going through. So what is the cure? And that is every suffering person needs compassion. Addicts relapse so often because they are published, they are punished rather than understood, least of all by themselves. Compassion facilitates healing. When we love and understand another, it's forcing our true selves out of their hiding place. For me, personally, it wasn't until I ripped my guts out and smeared it out in front of me that I could see what I actually had to deal with. To realise that I'd become a slave to my distractions, because I just didn't know any other way of coping. But real coping comes from nakedness, honest nakedness, and acceptance and a true understanding of how trauma or distress affects us. For me, by accepting my distress, I move further away from all the distractions that I use to avoid it. Thank you for listening. Thank you.